going on, everyone? This is AJ from Adventure Co. Gaming. This is Battle Worn number seven. Number seven coming at you, Ryan. Yeah, it's uh, what's it called? It's the most, it's the soon to be most popular podcast on YouTube for Flesh and Blood. <laughs> That's right. We're coming. We're coming for it. You know, every episode has gotten more viewers than the last. And I think a lot of that's because I fixed the volume last time. <laughs> so. It does help when people can hear the conversation. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we have a good episode for you today. We have a lot to talk about, a lot of current stuff, a lot of happenings going on in the Flesh and Blood sphere. But first things first, my name's AJ. This is Adventure Company Gaming. And again, like I said, this is Battle War number seven. And that's my wonderful co-host, Ryan, over there to the right. What's up? I'm Ryan. Yeah, what's up? And we're going to be talking about quite a lot today. So we have a couple things to get through. First things first, let's talk about some news. So we got some spoiler cards for you. Going to talk about that in just a second. We have a couple that we got uh, still expansion slot cards from Part the Miss Vale. You know what? I'm going to let you start off with this, Ryan. It's going to be Shadow Realm Horror for your old bay, Levia. Um, I'm going to read it off. It's got quite a bit of text on it, but then I'm going to let you have the first word on this card. So this I is, appreciate it. This is Shadow Realm Horror. It is a two-cost red pitch card. Uh, it comes in for six attack, uh, three block Shadow Brute action attack. It says, as an additional cost to play this, banish three random cards in your graveyard. If one or more cards was with six or more power are banished this way, this gets plus one attack. Two or more, this gets go again. Three or more you play a card from your banished. Oh, uh, you may play a card banished this way this turn. And it has blood debt. So why don't you jump on in there, Ryan? So this has been an absolutely insane majestic. Something that I thought about a while ago. Um, I ne unfortunately have never said it on the podcast to show the record, but I thought about like a majestic that did something like this. It was um, possibly like a non-attack buff. Where it's like depending on the amount of sixes you banish you get x effects for your next attack but instead they just decided to print it on the attack itself so <laughs> that's pretty insane um yeah the fact that it gets plus one and go again and then play one of the banished cards if they're all three sixes to choose from like i, I this card is like a one-man army basically of majestics for Leviah. um it has the same rate as a uh um, it's got the same base rate as the um, Dread Screamer. So it's uh, if it actually banishes the 2-6, it has the go again, plus an extra damage. And then again, Seven like I said, being in. able to play... Yeah. Uh, and then again, being able to play one of the banished cards. Like if you banish something simple like a Graveling Growl or Slitherpeed or something, like that's a two-card, easy two-card... Um, uh, what's it called? Seven plus seven, potentially. Two-card 14. That's wild. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because, like, I just – the upside on this card is so incredibly high that compared to all the other banished random, three random cards, I don't, I don't even know if anything comes close to it. Maybe the one that uh, comes in for nine if you banish a six or higher. Endless Maw, yeah. Yeah, Endless Maw. But, man, the upside on this card – and getting to play the banished card if you banish all three, I mean, that happens a lot where they banish all three. There is going to be times where you whiff. Uh, not everything. You probably won't. It's 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 interesting that you have to play this at a good time because you could have a couple misses in your graveyard, and a two for seven while above rate isn't really like where you want to be with this card. You're probably assuming that you're going to get go again with this card every time. So you're, it's almost like the it's almost like the opportunity cost of like a scab skin leathers. Right where they mm -hmm. at, like you hold cards because you expect to have go again. Then if you miss on this card and you're just like, oh, okay, two for seven, I IP'd myself. So I don't know, something like essentially, that. Essentially, so. essentially. But other than that, yeah, you know, I think you can play this card and you can filter it in a way that you almost always hit at least the two of three, uh, kind of thing. So and it always gets go again. Basically, two go again, seven like seven attack is freaking wild. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is interesting to note that this is the only Majestic uh, Shadow Brute card that banishes three as a cost. Every other one is just a side effect or kind of like a... Is I it really part say, of the effect? Really? Yeah. None of the other Majestics for Shadow Brute cost three to banish to play. They definitely um, do, Ryan. What are you talking about? I just looked up Endless Maw. It says as an additional cost to play Endless Maw. I said Majestic. Oh, Majestic. What's another Majestic? Yeah, Majestic. Uh, what is that? Yeah, like? yeah, yeah. 
Deep Rooted uh, Evil. That's that's something that says oh, you can play but that's, from Banish. Yeah, but that's supposed, uh, like that one is supposed to be like one of the cards you like back in the day. That's one of the cards you wanted to banish with it, right? Like you wanted this yeah, card. Yeah, but that's like, what that's what I'm saying. This is the ex- only example of a majestic that banishes three for cost. Gotcha. Even. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm picking up is, what you're putting down now. Yeah, it, it's weird that it's taken this long. You think they would have done something like this before, but maybe they just thought it would be too powerful, like this one looks like. So <laughs> they had to wait a while before they gave Levia Levia this um, uh, power card. So oh, I'm definitely excited for it. It's probably. One of the best Majestics in terms of like on rate or potential yeah. for like just a uh, two card hands uh, in the game that I can think of. Like this card is a one man army, like I said. Yeah, no, this card is definitely like freaking nuts, honestly. Like I think it's I think it's just so good. I, and I think it's something that Leviah, like she's starting to pick up some steam. Uh, I think a lot of people are kind of hesitant, hesitant to pick up the deck. Uh, because of like her reputation of like being terrible <laughs> up until this point, I think Mansan's putting a lot of work trying to reverse that reputation. But I think it's just really hard for like I, I think a lot of new players, like, new players or new to Leviah players, will kill themselves with blood debt like twice and be like, I'm good. <laughs> like I don't know. Like, Can I be honest? I like. There's quite a few people who see Leviathan and they're like, oh, I want that to be my first hero. We've had some locals, like at least three local players be like, yo, that Leviathan, that's sick. I want to play that. No, yeah. <laughs> I probably have to learn the hard way about uh, the consequences of Blood Day. <laughs> also managing the turn to flip into Consumed, uh, mm-hmm. assuming they even have that card because it's a legendary, I think uh, is a big part of it, too. Yeah. Hmm, I wonder why AJ brings that point up. Hmm. What? It's almost like something happened recently. What happened? Oh, when uh, there was a, the judge call asking about the effects of Levi consumed on uh, sat- Sunday when you were uh, the judge. Oh. Of the, uh, collectives, uh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's like stuff like that for a new player definitely is uh, quite confusing. Yeah, I mean, they were just I mean, I think they were just getting clarification. I think the question was it was kind of funny because. Um, they had asked me, uh, like, what is Leviah's effect? And I was like, I don't know, what, like, like specifically or like, like what do you mean? Like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I remember I was, I was just standing, <laughs> I was so, standing there watching it. So, so I mean, it, it, to your point, it is like Leviah is not the most uh, straightforward hero. Um, and yeah, no, I just... <laughs> It wasn't it wasn't a dumb question or anything like that. I can definitely see where it's like, what no, do I do not. at this point? Especially because so many things are happening when Leviah goes to flip, right? Because you have to stop your blood debt chain, right? Like you're not chain, but like assuming there's like five blood debt you're taking and you take two to get down to thirteen, and then you stop there, and then you flip, and then you like from that point on, everything else gets you no longer take the rest of the blood debt. You just banish the cards or whatever. And like, I don't know. It could be like confusing. There's so many like moving parts. And then you're like, all right, what was the point? <laughs> oh yeah. I get to play all these banished cards now. Yeah. But for the rest but of the just, game, you know, you don't get to play like you're kind of on a clock, right? So. Yeah. And uh, to get back to what we were talking about, like Leviah picking up steam. Finally, mm-hmm. I think there's still just like on the competitive sense, players who are hesitant to pick up a hero that has above rate attacks above rate like aggression but has such a huge downside as blood debt that um they may not be prepared or willing to take the risk for compared to ko right Right. now which has no (laughs) risk besides playing zero blocks why would i risk killing myself with blood debt or like like fucking up my leviah flip consume turn or all this other like extra steps you have to take when i can just go blood rush bellow here's what 400 five, damage. Five, like five, eight, eight on like a bad blush, blood rush bellow turn. <laughs> Is that yeah. 21 damage? <laughs> so, uh, and so, it's only going to get better, but we'll yeah, talk about I, that soon. Yeah, I've, I've heard with the new chess piece, <laughs> it's actually like all the implications of the KO deck. I hear the chess piece with the blood rush bellow turn can be really freaking stupid. So anyway, <laughs> uh, that was the first card. Good conversation there. We're going to move on to the second card, which I know a yeah, lot of people love, love- are... Love the new one man army. Yeah, I think a lot of people are really excited for this. If you play Vincent, if you're a Shadow Room Blade, you're 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 Jones and for a good Shadow Room Blade card, I think you're gonna get it. So this is Eloquent 
Eulogy, it's a one cost red, uh, has rune gating, which we've seen on most new shadow rune blade cards. Uh, and then it says rune gate, uh, and it's a one cost. So it's just basically rune gate one, um, which is good. It's the first one we're getting that it's a one cost, but when this combat chain closes, if a hero has lost life this turn, create an eloquence token, uh, and it has blood debt, uh, it comes in for four and blocks for three. So pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I think, I'm just going to say real quick, I think the thing that most people have realized is that this finally gives Vincent a one-card hand where yeah. uh, if you were to block out with your hand <laughs> in Vincent, uh, you were kind of just, you kind of passed the turn uh, a lot of the time you because of Vincent's ability where you have to banish a card in your hand at the start of your turn. It's like not an optional thing. So this lets you, at the very least, uh, you banish this card, you create a rune chant. Um, now that because it's cost one, it has rune gate, you can play the the one cost thing for free and you get the rune chant. And if your opponent takes any damage, you get an eloquence token, which if you don't remember what an eloquence token does, uh, it's basically a quick in for a non-attack action. It's really good. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I mean, so it's basically a zero, uh, a one card five, basically, because the rune chant yes. you create with your ability <laughs> and then the, the just ability to play it for free with no extra resource pitching after. Yeah, it's a zero. Co it's a zero cost five. Yeah, uh, so, yeah, zero cost five with upside. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's a pretty insane majestic. And that's the Good floor. Thing. That's the floor of the card, right? That's you blocked with everything. Yeah. And you just mm -hmm. had that. That's all you had left. Uh, and if they want to block with everything, they're going to have to give up two cards because you have to pitch and you have to block at least. You can also guarantee this effect pretty easily. Uh, you know, between Vincent's ability making the one that if you play what a non attack action, a rune blade non attack action, a shadow non attack, a action. shadow non attack action. So you go shadow puppetry, activate the effect of uh, Vincent, Vincent, and then you take a life and then you play this card. It doesn't really matter what your opponent does, it's just damage at that point. But you will get the eloquence token because a hero has lost life. Um, and the eloquence tokens again. Uh, they can lead to some really stupid things uh, in Vincent. I mean, that like gives you go again on a read the runes or something like that. So, yeah, this card is very good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Read the runes is probably the best choice for you when you instantly want to ring gate something out. Uh, there's also the tomes, uh, both the uh, Tome of Findel oh, uh, yes, 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 for yes. you to play from Arsenal um, or even... Um, uh, what's the tome called? Tome, tome of, of Torment. Torment. Yeah, I Which get, I get you what you're saying. That's pretty good. Banish. Actually, I like that. And then you get the card back. Yeah. So you basically, well, you don't even have to play it on the same turn. You can pocket dimension that for one big, big turn and be like, I draw uh, an extra card to have an extra Draw like one hand. or two or something like that. If you put like three in there. Oh, I mm -hmm. guess that wouldn't work though. Sorry, because uh, it's <laughs> the whole point to... of the eloquence token. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, she does have another card you can pocket dimension the um uh whatever the shadow angel looking card is that creates an eloquence token um and can be played at instant speed if uh someone's taken damage that turn i forget what it's called um but that card so you can you could technically chain it um but that's why I always thought Vincent had a strong argument for her um, as a hero. Maybe just something that people haven't figured out is that people just need to use that pocket dimension more to save cards for like a big hand. The only difference between her and Chain is that Chain just banished his deck into the pocket dimension basically at, at, uh, well, at the end of the game. You kind of so. started touching on something that I kind of wish they had done with Chain in the first place is that like I wanted blood debt to actually matter. Like you were like uh, in chain, you didn't really take a whole lot of blood debt. Maybe you took it a couple times off your chest piece or something like that. But you really like, unless you were playing against like Oldham and you had to like sandbag like a really huge turn, uh, you yeah. really didn't like take blood debt. It almost like didn't well, like it was an unused mechanic in chain for the most part. Uh, yeah. Every now and again, it mattered. Every now and again, you get to those games where you do weirdly get to like three life and then you have like two cards that you can't play or whatever. And the prison plays an ALS and that's how they kill you or something like that. Like, uh, yeah. But overall, it was like chain really didn't like take blood debt. What I think I like about this is you kind of pay the blood debt to have that like really good turn. Like you say, like, I'm going to eat like one, two points of damage on the two Vincent banishes. And now I'm going to have like this massive turn that like, you know, you have to like work for it, though. Vincent, you have to yeah. definitely work for it. And this definitely helps you work for it, for sure. Eloquent Eulogy is Absolutely. like really good. I think they're and knocking it out of the park with that card. 
oh, and it yeah. doesn't feel I unfair. Nice. I'll also say that. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. Because it's a, it's a majestic, so you're only going to have the three copies at most. Yeah. Um, and you can always I will force say, it out of uh, You can always make them uh, block with it. <laughs> exactly. Um, funny enough, you can play it more times, though, with something like um, uh, Rattlebones. So that's funny. Uh <laughs> But um, to get back to the main points, it's like, yeah, this is kind of like the tempo swing, tempo swing thing that you were talking about, uh, Guardian, uh, during the last podcast. Kind of like you missed the old days where it's like you had a turn of setup mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. for a really big payoff. Like Vincent is a better version of that, in my opinion. And it has some drawback. You take some health um, to be able to set up the turn instead of just just taking a turn off. Plus, the fact that she always has to work with three card hands most of the time uh, is also a big drawback. But I think the payoffs can be so insane if you know how to set it up. Yeah, I think she I think a lot of the decks that we're seeing nowadays between Prism, Vincent, uh, you know, a lot of these like more complicated heroes, they're really rewarding players for learning those decks and learning every single play line, every single counterplay and what you can really hone in and deal with, like do with that deck. I think they're doing a good job of giving you the tools to do that and then letting players like figure it out. And I think players are figuring it out and doing some really cool things. Exactly. I agree. And I love, uh, you know what? Taking a step back, even from the gameplay, the artwork on this thing is sick. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, both these cards, I actually really like the artwork, the shadow realm horror. I really love that. They're keeping the, when I think of like Levia and like the whole like plasma fet thing, I think of like, I think of exactly Eldritch. Shadow of Blasma Fett. Um, Eldritch Horror, basically. Well, yes, but I think of like Shadow of Blasma Fett where like there's like a town, right? And so they're going about their day and then suddenly it gets darker and darker and darker. And it's like suddenly the sun just disappears. We just had that happen here. <laughs> well, like suddenly the sun just like disappears and now you have like these demons like kind of, so it's like this feeling of like ominous like terror. Um, mm -hmm. like almost like a foregone conclusion. I'm going to die in the worst way possible. <laughs> and it's oh, kind of yeah. the vibes I give, I get from this card. You know, they got the, got the eclipse in the top, right. We're still in like what looks like if you look in the corners, we're in like a, a Salonian town or whatever still. And then you just have mm -hmm. this like really wild looking like horror thing. And it's like doing its thing killing people yeah <laughs> i will say it's nice of them to throw in a little easter egg to remind us of chain even though he's no longer with us with oh, the, the eclipse. eclipse in the background <laughs> <laughs> um and then to your point uh, the eloquent eulogy i'm pretty sure that's vincent in the background i could be wrong uh, kind of looks yeah. like yeah uh, which is like funny because it's not a specialization but that's definitely her is do you think that's the um uh viscerai on the table kind of looks like him to be honest i don't know though Nah, it's definitely chain. Look at that long hair and everything on that. It, <laughs> might, on it might be. I mean, is that a rune chant that's like kind of around him? Is that what it looks like in like real life? I don't know. Kind of actually. Now that you mention it, it could be like a or that's the rune gate. That's the rune gate. Oh, is that's that the rune like. gating? Is just rune yeah. gating this dude? So the eloquent eulogy is just when you throw this naked dude at people. <laughs> you know, I'd like to think that's canon now. <laughs> All right. Uh, so that's those two cards. We're going to move on to, I guess, what kind of is the main topic. And then we'll wrap up with, like, the season three or week three of ProQuest meta. Um, yeah. But I do want to bust into our main topic. So our main topic, if you haven't heard, KO, Armed and Dangerous, is getting a, is getting a, a deck. And that deck has just recently been spoiled. Spoiled. Released. They released the deck list. Uh, yeah. We'll have that up on the screen for you. You can take a look at it. Uh, and there has been some controversy both both ways. So I'll just summarize what I know of what's happening. So KO deck gets spoiled. Or not spoiled. KO deck gets shown. Um, people see, over time, they see the chess piece. They see run roughshod. And they see the command and conquer effect. It's like a, a strength above all. Yeah. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they see those three cards and they think, oh, my God, this thing's insane. <laughs> this deck is going to be too strong and those cards are super powerful and KO is already strong. Why does he need it? Then <laughs> fast forward a few weeks, we get released the entire deck list uh, this morning, 
yesterday. I think it leaked yesterday, and then this morning they actually posted it. Yeah. Uh, so they actually posted the deck list, and I'll be honest, outside of the three cards that have gotten spoiled, it's probably 10 to $20 in, in loose cards. $20 being very generous. Uh, probably okay. closer to 10 uh, $10 in cards. So um, that said, you're finding your value in those. And again, just summarizing the issue, and I'll let you weigh in. But uh, so a lot of people are seeing, saying you have to find your value in those new cards, and that's kind of what you're buying the product for. And then there's this discussion of who is the product for, who's the target, who's the target audience for this. And uh, I'll just let you first thoughts, Ryan, on the KO structure deck. Or I shouldn't say structure deck. I should call it what it's called. The KO Armory deck coming out, I believe, this weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this Friday it should be. Um, but yeah, in a when I first look at this in like a vacuum sense, this deck actually like it's I think it's worth the forty dollars because when you think about a chess piece that game changing, like if you're gonna be a KO or brute player like Leviya, Reinar, or KO, you need that chess piece. That thing on a single turn, blood rush turn, has far more value than Tunic will ever offer you in a single game, in my opinion. I think it depends um, especially, specifically on the matchup. I just want to interject. I think if you are playing a very slow deck that's making you play slow, I think there's an argument for Tunic. But go on. Go on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's just making. So just as a brute player, I will say that when you do blood rush turns and you need to have that momentum swing, it really sucks when you don't have enough resources <laughs> for it. So yep. this one count can count as like two to three resources on a single turn plus the block value on it this thing is insane so um when you look at like what a meta card like this would go for um even as a majestic um depending on pull rates you're looking at at least 20 to 25 dollars for a card like this like look at blade flurry right now something that needs to be a three of in a deck instead of just a one of but nonetheless a very strong card uh and then you've got my or um strength rules the mall and uh, the other one uh, not super expensive, not like you're going to lose if you don't have them, but good cards on their own right. Strength um, rules all, by the way. I know we kept saying, I was like, there's no way that's what it's called. It doesn't sound right. Strength, strength rules, rules all, all. yes. The, <laughs> um, by no means um, cards you need in order to succeed, but definitely strong cards in their own right. Um, I would say that at least totals like you could say $25 of like secondhand mm -hmm. market value. Um and then the other cards, if you're already an experienced player, you probably have all those cards. Um, so you're just kind of like taking the extra fluff to get these meta cards, um, which because of their exclusivity would technically be more now. Um, yep. But, but um, that's in a vacuum. I would say I would like to see more from LSS when it comes to these sealed products, even these introductory products, because um, we've already had our experience with the, um, the bl uh, Blitz Ready decks or the don't they have another name like battle ready decks or just battle? Are you decks? talking about the blitz decks? They're just called blitz, yeah, decks. blitz decks. Yeah, the blitz. Okay, they're just called blitz. Yeah, the, uh, yes, that. Um, and those are great introductory decks for the game. Um, and I agree. It's kind of like good to get them into more of the blitz format to suss out the game because you require less. It's faster. You can get more games say. in. That's for yes, sure. That. And you can like start over if you've mess up and die you're gonna like, all right let's reset this didn't this wasn't some huge time investment or anything like that so in yeah. each of them is in each of them is made to show you what that hero kind of wants to do it gives you an idea or, or a feel for the hero that you're uh, buying the deck for no i like that, that point being, i like that point go ahead i'll let you finish up sorry that being said this ko deck uh can definitely be seen as a starter deck as well because you could just buy the deck and bam you're ready to play in an armory I think as an intro product, like excluding, like if you're a new player, excluding the value on those stronger cards, because you don't even know if you're going to stick with the game after you get this. I think $40 is a bit steep. But and again, this is what uh, I'll pass it off to you going into the discussion, like talking about who who is this for? Like, what is this product for? Is it yeah. onboarding? Is it for experienced players to want to try the hero they've never bought into or... <laughs> Like, what is what is the point of this? So I'll say this uh, just to answer your question or kind of what you're leading to. I think everyone's doing this deck a disservice. This is just how I feel. I think everyone's kind of doing this deck a disservice, this product a disservice by saying it's for new players. 
I think it's definitely a good product if you're a new player. I think it definitely like I'm just like this whole time you're talking, I was kind of looking over the deck list a little bit and just it's I will say this. It's very clean. Um, It's missing some distinct brute cards like Blood Rush Bellow and Swing Big. Yeah. But like just looking at it looks like you're not like going to be fumbling around with like cards that don't like work together. You definitely have a lot of go again generation and then you have payoffs for that go again. So I, I don't know who's the deck for. I want to pick one up and I want to try my, like if I, if let's say I am an entrenched prism player, right. And I've only ever really bought singles. Let's just say that. <laughs> let's just say that's me. <laughs> I have no. I definitely have not only bought singles, but let's say I'm entrenched prism player because that's yes. Hello. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, I just want to try something different. I just want to try something different. And my LGS has this one, and maybe the next two, right? So whatever the next two armory decks, which they're coming out like every other month, it's pretty quick. Um, so they have these like three decks on the list, and I'm just like. You know, I heard KO's good. Let me just pick it up. I'm going to pick it up and play it at my armory. I'm going to see how it does, and I'm going to see if I want to go forward with KO, right? And I don't, I personally don't think $40 is an investment that's not worth doing that with, if that makes sense. Like, I think that's a fair ask for something like that. Now, uh, I'll, start, I'll start with all the things that I think are good, because that's kind of where I'm at right now. And then I'll kind of move to... I'll let you say that, and then we'll go to like what we think could be better about it. So yeah, because so, I definitely have uh, an opinion as a entrenched brute player <laughs> uh, from the past. Yeah, to absolutely. Kind of say a little more about it. So Savage Sash is the chess piece that we've been alluding to. Uh, it does say um, action destroy this attack action cards with six or more power costs you uh, a resource less to play for the rest of the turn, um, and go again. Right. So. I think that's very strong and it has temper too. very strong. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you're getting a lot of value. And I'll also say this, uh, as far as value is concerned, I think if you change the M to an L on this card and everyone loses, like then people like don't care as much. <laughs> okay. Like, I, and I think it would definitely warrant an L honestly, if it was like in a main set, I think like it could be on that level. Oh but, yeah. That said, especially with temper too, especially with temper too. So that said, uh, the last things I like about this deck, you have like Savage Beatdown. You have like a lot of these like different cards, like I said, um, that are like even Run Roughshod, which is just a five power attack, but you can only play it if you've played a, if you've uh, discarded a card with six or more power this turn. But it's a one for five, right? So I think it's one for like, five blue. Yeah, ex- that's what I was getting. At. Yeah, one for five blue. So very good. And if you've used the chess piece that turn, you can play it for free. But <laughs> no, because it's not a six power card. Uh, it is until uh, it's on the chain. Is that how it works? Yes. <laughs> oh, well then. Yes, it has six power K- until K- the K- ability even yeah. more insane. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not on the chain until the layer is off. Then it goes on the combat chain. OK, so yeah. uh, until it's not considered on the chain until you pay the cost. And at the time, the cost would be one less. Yeah. Ooh. All In- right, yeah, that's, that's insane, right? So. So, <laughs> yeah, otherwise, like, all these blues would kind of suck with this chess piece. But, no, you get to, you do get to play them uh, for one less. So, yes, the chess piece is even better than most people probably think. So, yeah, so I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that said, like I was saying before, you have Go Again Generation, like Clash of Agility, Pulping, uh, Wild Ride, uh, just a lot of these, like, Go Again cards. Main and track. Then, Bean trackers, Bean trackers. Uh, and then you have the payoffs like like strength rules all savage beat down uh, bear fangs red you know these big you know kind of ender that don't have go again so you just want to hit them really hard or whatever or have this like good on it effect like strength rules all which is like a command and conquer at home but very good I mean most people are going to be most decks are going to put an attack card in their arsenal depending um, I think it's very strong I think you play it so that's all the mm-hmm. It's like most of the good. I think it's very well built. Um, do you have anything good right now, Ryan? Just like what else do you have to say about uh, the deck? Well, 
So, yeah, I mean, like I said, even if you're an entrenched brute player who has all the other cards that are included, um, picking it up for at least the three exclusive cards that were revealed, mm -hmm. um, like, I think it's worth the pickup. Even at $40. Four. Sorry, you technically could... four. High Tanner is also in there. And is exclusive. Oh, that's right. That one. <laughs> and I can see that seeing, uh, I can see that uh, getting some play if you haven't picked up an Apex Bonebreaker or, or even in an format threes. Yeah. Yeah, or an aggro decks where you want to play it faster. Um, I would say that, like, when you look at, like we talked about, the value of the um, Sash in most decks or most Brute decks um, feels like it's on board with, like, today's Legendaries. And people wouldn't really scoff at paying $40 for, like, a decent Legendary, right? Yeah. So I think for even entrenched Brute players, just to get their hands on the playable cards that they know they're going to use, I think it's worth the one-time investment. Now... I'm ready to move on to the. What <laughs> I'll, we I'll let you go right into it. I'll let you. I'll let you jump right in. So, like I said, most of what I said was in a vacuum. Now, when we consider the value that other companies or other card games give their kind of like sealed products that price around this range, uh, new cards or not, they're they usually come with a lot more or cost a lot less. Can um, I can I give an example? Well, yeah. as you're talking. And I know what you're probably thinking is I'm going to give the Grand Archive or or the other one or Grand Archive example because they're coming out with something that's sort of similar. But I'm actually going to give an even different example. The Challenger decks in Magic uh, mm -hmm. were standard ready decks. And I think they made one for Pioneer as well, but I stopped playing Magic by then. The Challenger decks were standard ready car ready decks that had sideboards which is where i'm gonna go but i just want to say that <laughs> and had relevant uh mythics i'd remember the name for it <laughs> relevant mythics from those decks and were built around you know worlds or nats or level competitive play so yeah. it's just an idea like think about that so go ahead sorry <laughs> And well, I guess the comparison comes um, if even if it's just the deck, like how much did those cost? Uh, what is a challenger deck it was like 40 bucks, I think. And that was like a few years ago. Maybe they were 30, some 30 or 40 bucks, I think. I remember buying commander decks for magic uh, during Strixhaven and those were 30 bucks each. Well, so, commander is very different. Uh, and those were like the precons. Um, those are like starter decks for commander, like okay. level. Anyway, sorry. Um, but they did have, they did have, ex regardless, they did have cards that were only in those products. So you could say that if it doesn't include anything else, $30 might be more appropriate, even less if you're comparing it to like Pokemon or Yu Gi Oh! For actually, I don't think Yu Gi Oh! has competitive pre built decks, but Pokemon. They do in a like weird a, way. You have to buy three of them and mash them together, and then they're fine, and depends on the archetype. <laughs> yeah, but to be more concise, Pokemon with a 60 card uh, battle ready deck that actually has some competitive viability, 20 bucks and has very meta relevant cards in it. Now, Pokemon's market and flesh and blood secondhand market very different, but that's not the point. It's about what the company gives you for what you're paying for. Um, and in that yeah. sense, I feel like this could either be a bit cheaper or include just something a little more exclusive, you know, something, yeah. something else. That's not I just know. a card. Give me something, <laughs> give me something I can. I believe like, the two uh, main deck cards are foil. Does that entice you, Ryan? <laughs> I already told you I'm buying the damn thing. Don't worry. Yeah, I mean, I'm it. buying um, it too. I need, I want to play the cards and I have a video <laughs> idea with it. So I don't want to spoil that here, but I think it'll be fun. Uh, we'll save, so, save that for later. Save that for later. So, but, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, the foiling is nice, sure. But just, um, just to just to jump on what you're saying, I just think, I just think, uh, for me, uh, I don't even care about price to a point, right? I, I don't think forty dollars is egregious. I think that's fine. What I kind of wish that this deck had done, truly, what I think this deck had wish had, I, I just wish it had a sideboard. It doesn't. It has a sixty card main board. This is the deck you play. I get they want to make it like approachable pick up and play yeah pick up and play basically. i think you could definitely do that with just a quick little like sideboard guide not like a not like when you would see it like a competitive event where they're like every single matchup i think you say mm -hmm. like if you're playing an arcane based hero put these in <laughs> and like how and to sideboard some no and yeah, like have some no rune equipment in it at least and guess what flesh and blood has different sideboarding rules 
than every other card game. <laughs> so uh -huh. any other card game with a sideboard. So teach them how to sideboard. Say, reveal hero. See who goes first. Then if you're playing uh, arcane based hero, put in this like these three pieces of null rune that we gave you or even uh, not null rune, the other thing. <laughs> spell void. Put in this spell void yeah. that we gave you. Something like that. I just think it would have been really cool to see. Um, again, we haven't seen them actually unbox it, so I don't even know if it comes with anything other than like you open it and it's just like a sealed thing of cards and nothing else. I hope it gives you like a kind of like breakdown of like what the deck's trying to do, at least from a very basic standpoint. I don't know. I I, I think I, I said this on Twitter under someone's post. I think it was Roger Bodie, but I could be wrong. But basically, <laughs> I think this is a A plus idea product. And this is like a C plus execution. Uh, maybe a B minus somewhere in there. It's passing. It's fine. It's not stellar. Um, I think my thing is like, I just wish a little bit more. It's almost there. I just, the sky yeah. is not falling either. I just want to say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, the idea that this is the worst thing that they've done or like the idea that they've completely failed at making it like, no, 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 no. But I mean, I want, I want flesh and blood products. I want, yeah. give me like, give me even just like a little dice with the fab logo on it. Even like yeah. a six -sided die. No, that'd be sick. That'd be cool. Um, I know they have like, um, I know fab metal tokens already makes really good token products for, uh, flesh and blood. And they probably don't want to step on their toes by adding those, but like maybe partner with them, include like just a quick, like resource token, um, in a specific color to the deck maybe, um, or, uh, you know, just something there's so much that the game can play with in terms of like their own products, kind of like how Pokemon has like poison and burn counters that yes. look different every, from time to time. Um, and then they also each uh, uh, box that you buy comes with a set of dice that match the color of the box uh, that you got. And it's like, yeah, something simple like that. We ain't asking for the world. Just give us some flesh and blood products like we want more than just cards. We want. Well, to your point, even oh, with that, I love new flesh and blood cards, and that's why I'm not mad that this has exclusives in it. I think that's yeah. fine. I think getting new cards is great. And what's the difference between buying them? Especially, I, I think it's so funny that people are complaining about this having new cards. It's so like narrow minded, in my opinion, because like, what is the difference between like LSS selling you a forty dollar bundle of like singles, if you want to think about it like that? Versus you going to TCG player and just buying them anyway. What is the big difference? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Why is it so egregious that these are in a pre-con deck versus in a random loot box booster box? Now, if your argument is scarcity, I understand that. If that's the issue, but then I have an issue with scarcity and not the delivery, if that makes sense. I have an issue with... Yeah them choosing how much to print and not the fact that they printed it this way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think it's crazy, Ryan. <laughs> I think it's crazy. I don't think it's that serious. <laughs> nah, me neither. And to be honest, like, even though I say I really like the chess piece for like those blood rush turns and a bit of extra armor, I can still see the arguments even after giving it a little more thought where flat, where find L's over longer games is still like better value yeah, overall. Yeah. I think it's a choice um, and that's kind of what they want, or, right? Like, or even heart, even heart and cross strap to just be like, pop this. And what of my brute attacks <laughs> on this turn for the blood rush turn is just free. You have to remember that this has temper to you before you start saying heart and cross. No, 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 no. <laughs> not as not as good as not as good without that, of course. But like I'm just saying in the resource management side of it. But I think they should. Still, I think they truly should have just put a little L on it and made it cold foil. And people would have been like, great. <laughs> like <laughs> It really wouldn't have cost them any more to do it or even it would have been a little bit more. I mean, you'd actually, save it the cold foil, even if but. it's at, oh, yes, yes, of course. But even if it was still an M, but cold foil. Ooh. I'm surprised Even it didn't come cold foil. I'm really surprised because I wonder if I, I mean, we don't know the back end, right? We don't know how much it costs them to print these. I wonder if, and, and I will say this about price. Anytime I see a price that I think is a little too high for a flesh and blood product, it comes back to, I think that is for the LGS more than it's for LSS because 
SS has done their best to keep the promise that their products will have as much value as possible in a sealed environment, right? So a lot of, a lot of, uh, stores make their money off single sales, right? Well, Mm -hmm. that's rough because what if you get a really bad, you know, I'm just gonna say it, bad magic set, you have, uh, distributors force you to buy a certain amount to keep good standing with them. And then you're stuck Mm -hmm. with a set that just doesn't sell. The singles don't sell and the margins are awful even when you do sell it. Right. So they buy a box for like 89, they sell it for like 95 and then everyone gets mad yeah. because they can find it for 93 online. They think you're stealing from them. So, yeah. <laughs> so my point is, my point is they have done from my understanding, LSS has done their best that even with map pricing, that you're still making some decent margin on their product. And so I, again, I don't know how much it costs LSS to make these, but I bet you the margin after map is still very good for the LGS, not for LSS. So, yeah, and I think for when it comes to stand, like I, y- people have their own opinions, I'm sure, but I personally I feel like it's not often appreciated on that end. Like for certain LGSs, like good, honest, and uh, hardworking LGSs to be able to you know make their money back for supporting events, for running events, and keeping everything like stable so that you know we can keep playing their games or keep playing an armor right. on a weekly basis don't like, you like having a place to play ryan isn't it nice that you can go to a store and they sell flesh and blood cards and then they you can then play flesh and blood at the store in an organized play environment god yeah. forbid we support that <laughs> and on top of that these armory decks, the reason they're called armory decks is because they're made to be played at armory for stores that host armories the only stores getting these decks are stores that are actively hosting armories. I don't know if you know that, but that's great. Like mm-hmm. supports the LGS even more. I mean, these stores aren't, they aren't charities, but they still need our support in terms of like actually giving them our patronage and like, you know, yeah. Give it like giving them a reason to be open. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, most people don't real most people don't know the back end stuff of that, but you've pr- explained it pretty well here for people who don't know that yeah, there's a lot more that goes into the pricing of products than just like the actual like things that are included. So um Yep. But yeah, I mean personally, I think it could would have been nice if we just got like a little something more, you know, like I said, counters, dice, something, something fun something, that makes yeah, it feel like something a cool. blood product. A deck box. Um, even if it's like sort of good but not great i don't know something yeah yeah no i'm Um, on board with that i i totally i think that's fair i don't know how much that would have jacked the price up i don't know even if we got a lore something or other a little storybook i don't know i just i don't know just if it's just you open the box and it's a deck of cards and it's 40 bucks i kind of understand the hesitation there and it's weird yeah. because, like, some people will say, like, well, if they put a Command & Conquer in it, they could have charged $60. And it's like, I don't know if that's even fair because it doesn't cost I, LSS, I like, don't, more money. Like, I was going to say, like, LSS does not – like, you're right. LSS does not co- – it doesn't cost them that much more to print an, a different card that has a different secondhand market value. If this was a but Command & Conquer, LSS, it cost them the exact amount of money to reprint it. <laughs> like exactly the, as it did to but, print heavy artillery <laughs> but that's what i'm saying they yeah. shouldn't i don't think they should do that i don't think they should price things based off their secondhand market value like the lss should be making let it like they should be encouraging the secondhand market value because it keeps interest in the game or makes it so that the demand for um like reprints or more accessibility in the future if a meta card needs to be reprinted is more justified um but I don't think they should be basing their card prices off of the secondhand market value being the distributor who has like, who can print them out like for one cent a, a card in like a bulk. Right. Bulk printing right. Press, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, I don't know. I think they should make the best product for their players and their stores that support them. And I think they're trying to do mm-hmm. that. And whether yeah. or not you agree with what's in this, in the contents of this deck or if the deck exists at all, it bothers you. I think they're trying and I think in your feedback, you should be constructive and you can say what you liked, what you didn't like. 
and uh, yeah, because, stop being mean about it. <laughs> I don't know. I was going to say, everyone's <laughs> going to have their little tidbits here and there of what they think is the best because everyone comes from different card games, too, and every card game does, the, does it their own way. But, um, yeah, it's not bad to voice your opinions on what you dislike about it, but there's, there's, there's a respectful way to do it, and LSS, I believe, will listen if we voice our opinions in a constructive way. I think so, too. Than, uh, and for all you people Pitch freaking way. out, that's why Brian left Twitter. So good job. Keep doing that. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's anything else to say on the KO deck, Ryan? I think we've touched on everything that we want to talk about. I think about. we've covered everything we want to. Like I said, LSS, if you listen to this, um, James White, <laughs> like I said, I would like little more exclusive like fab products, like even just like little dice, like a D6 that has like a cool uh set stamp on it or something that would be so cool so that's cool. what i loved about some other products from other games is that you have something that tells you yeah i'm a, a flesh and blood player this yeah, is my, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah absolutely this is, this absolutely. is my sig- this is how i show patron now I, I know they already give us mats and stuff for every armory i'm kit so over mats, dude. <laughs> yes i like, can't even show it on I camera will... this is all mats this is, I know. And these, like, I've had like double of this. I've given slash sold so many. I just keep getting them. <laughs> I know. Like, don't get me wrong. I love the mats. And every now and then there is a new one that really grabs me. But like, I have mats for my favorite heroes or like a specific one that I really like. And I can't use all of them at once. <laughs> no, like I, I, right. And this actually, this doesn't even include the two that I have in tubes that I actually take with me. And again, I've sold probably 10 more than what's here. I think it's so cool, but like, I think it'd be nice for the sealed products if we had just, you know, just like a little thing, not, not even big, just like just a little something else that tells us, tells other people we're, we're fab players. That's just, I really like the dice idea and me. especially for KO. It makes so much sense with brutes. Oh my God. <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah. It'd be Make really cool if I get like a, a green dice with like, I don't know. The one is his one arm. <laughs> <laughs> or a mandible claw or like an angry the mandible claws face. too because it's the two or whatever mm-hmm. it's got like two little mandibles on it all right that all said we're going to switch gears here we're going to talk about pro quest season three it's interesting uh because i have it up i don't know if you have it up ryan but i do have it up uh classic instructed wins for pro quest season three uh just gonna go down the list uh I mean, it's actually kind of interesting because we can talk about number one right away and kind of the implications of Living Legend. Is Living Legend even like we can't like get into the main comment. This is probably a good podcast topic. Uh, But do we think KO Armed and Dangerous at 24 wins and 404 Living Legends points is healthy for the game when he came out in February? (laughs) Like... Don't get me wrong. It was a life saving when Starvo rotated quickly because of it, because God knows we wanted him out of there <laughs> pretty quickly, <laughs> personally. Anyway, the thing is, like, um, Ko doesn't do I, that, no, though. He's the, he doesn't no. feel unfair. He feels just so consistent and strong. And I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say there's a difference between overpowered and oppressive versus just more consistent than other decks it does what it wants to do and it does it more easily than other decks that's really it and it's not even like he does anything that crazy like i said brutes for the most part um don't have on hit effects like certain other classes that you need to worry about so not yet anyway they have one now and then now they're getting another one in the starter deck so mostly mostly and even then those ones aren't completely like Backbreaking, I don't know. Sent packing is pretty wild, but it is. It is. <laughs> I, I said completely backbreaking, <laughs> but um, no. I, I think it's. Uh, I, I I agree with you. The points either need to be way or far lower than they're getting for LGS events, or it just need they. I don't. I don't agree with them having this many points just from. Um, these uh, small local store events because you don't know what the meta is. They could have had like nine participants in like eight of them. Uh, are KO. <laughs> were, yeah. And then it just kind of ran away with the events. Like, does that actually show like his prowess in the game versus other heroes? Or is that just like a happenstance of like that particular store's participation? I've also seen people float the idea and I'm not, I kind of hated it at first, but I kind of am growing into it. 
is what if Heroes had like a rookie season, a rookie year, and in that year they got like half the points that they normally would get? That would be cool. Now, this may be feel different as we get more and more sets released that change the meta on like a set to set basis. Because who knows? Maybe so soon- many though. <laughs> I know, but imagine, imagine if he had one PTLA. I'm sorry to cut you off, but imagine if he had one PTLA, he had 600 points, and he got released eight weeks ago. Like, or I'm sorry, probably closer to 10 weeks ago. But, like, that's insane. <laughs> no, it is. And I still think, I still agree with that. But um, you have to admit that when it comes to, like, sets releasing, like, the, how much do they say? Three sets a year now? Yeah, uh, three. So. We're getting a product release every month starting next year, but we're getting a okay. main set release, three main sets, and then the armory decks, and then probably some other product we don't know about. Yeah. So when you comes to that, like those main sets could change the meta to the point where like suddenly a hero like KO is played all the time, but then something in the new set and suddenly he's not played as much. Yeah. Um, so with the consistency of how much they're releasing new sets, I don't think we'll have another situation like Starvo again, unless a hero is really that badly over. I mean, this is close, though. This is actually close to that rate. It has to be. It is. It is. And that's why I'm saying, like, maybe it won't be as bad when the new set comes out. But you're you're right. The fact that he's already got this much before that set comes out, like, I think a rookie season where they make half the points during their first year of release would be a perfect way to let us have a little bit more longevity for them. Um, and what's and the LSS, harm, right? What's the harm? The hero lives for maybe another year. If that's like the worst case scenario, then a year longer than they would have. I think what's so LSS, bad about that. Someone gets to play their hero for another year. I don't know. <laughs> no, of course not. And that's what I'm saying. I think LSS, the two kind of what we've talked about in previous podcasts, like how balanced or kind of safe the sets kind of feel. Maybe they think this is a good system to make sure if something like Starvo happens again, that at least he's he leaves fast. Do we think um, do we think that KO is worthy of being hit on the ban list in any way at this rate? No, no, no. no. And that's no? what I'm saying. Like it was no. I would actually say I'm, maybe actually but i wouldn't i wouldn't do it in a way that neuters the deck at all it would have to be some consistency piece and that's it it would have to be like maybe wild ride or maybe like pulping maybe like the reason why the reason why i disagree with that is because like i feel like the consistency part of ko is just his hero ability it's just built into him no no no. but if you take away like one go again source maybe one of their turns is stunted and that's like okay maybe he's still a good deck you know what i mean like i'm not saying he just needs to i'm worried about at this rate right like just no, maybe agree. knocking off like his I don't know his win rate. Let's say it's 65%. It's probably less than that. Let's say it's 65%. Maybe taking a 65% down to 60, 60. You know what I mean? Like just getting yeah. him like more in line. Yeah. Like, you know, what I, all I was trying to say is that I, I was trying to gauge or kind of guess mm-hmm. the design space or like the headspace that LSS was in keeping it the way it is. Yeah. Um, is so that, another starvo can't happen yeah not saying ko not saying ko is but i think that with lss like how they've been doing a um haven't had covid to uh interrupt their (laughs) testing process like it did for those sets and having more time to build like they've built almost overly balanced sets for the past couple sets yeah and Um, having brian on the team i mean just since that the the sets have felt way more fair overall Again, I, I was just I, worried about how consistently he's been topping this list, and it doesn't seem like he's been slowing down. As a matter of fact, um, he's actually increased his lead from week two, so over yeah, the next and that's year. what I'm saying. I agree with you. I think they shouldn't be punished as much for their first uh, release or, like, first year um, at local L- um, LGS stores um, in terms of how fast they go to uh, Living Legend. Cause, yeah, like, yeah. I don't think it would be that hard to implement either. I think you could literally have like a a little denote, den, like something that denotes that they're on their rookie season on the Living Legend list on the website, and I think it wouldn't be that complicated. I don't think that would be I unclean don't either. or anything like that. So just a thought. No. I think we've talked enough about KO. We gotta move, we gotta move on to 
<laughs> Unless you have like bottom, something else. bottom line, I uh, just bottom line. I agree with uh, implementing some sort of change either at the store level for points or maybe just in yeah. like a like I said rookie season kind of thing. I've been saying from the like, very beginning, I, I don't be think to... stores should. I don't think the LGS should have a hand in Living Legend or card legality, in per my personal opinion. But no, they definitely are a bit janky sometimes, to say the <laughs> least. All right, number two. <laughs> Spend like 10 minutes on KO. Uh, number two, uh, Kasai the Golden Sand, probably the same list we've been seeing. Uh, just blocky, make block deck, boring as all and then hell. Bring out the honest. guys. I want to make and like a really aggressive Kasai, like I said last week. Yeah, bring out the guys. Uh, Victor, number three, and a 15. Now, this one's interesting because a lot of people say Victor sucks. <laughs> I've seen this on Twitter everywhere. Like, I don't understand how Victor's doing well. But who's, I think Victor's fine. That? A lot of people. I, the thing is, like, if you break it down it. on, like, a matchup-by-matchup matchup basis, it does feel like he's, like, what is he favored into? It doesn't feel favored into KO. It doesn't feel favored into Kasai. It doesn't feel favored into, like, Dorinthia. It does feel favored into Azalea. And, like, that's it. On, like, the top five of, like, what's good. It auto-loses the oh, competent Kano. Like, it's, like, horrible for them. <laughs> Don't most decks though? Maybe not KO. KO, uh, Prism KO does pretty well apparently. Prism. Uh, yeah, you're right. Prism. Prism. <laughs> Prism is the wizard's hard counter. Yeah. So um, I don't know. So I get where people say it sucks, but I think again we're in a meta that I think rewards player skill more than anything. So I think if you love your Victor deck, I think you shouldn't listen to anyone really, and you should play it, and you probably do very well. So Victor's if you're good on fine. It. Victor is just fine. His math is fine. It's just yeah. like play patterns, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Dorinthia Iron Song at 11. I'd be interested to know how many of those are on the Axes blocky Mick block deck and how many are on like a traditional Dawn Blade list. I want to see the I Dawn would... Blade list. <laughs> I know. Um, hopefully we will see one, but I'm my guess is that they're on the Axes list right now. Yeah, it's just the same my deck guess. as Kasai, but probably a little bit more value. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, then we go down to Azalea Ace in the Hole, and I'm kind of... It's kind of interesting to see this one all the way down at five. I really do think this deck preys on the aggro decks. The issue yeah. with Azalea is, so you want to get to this point. I, I've noticed it playing the deck. You want to get to this point where the boot is on their throat and you never let it off, right? They just can't do anything. And then there's a turn uh -huh. where you don't find it. You send like sleep dart to KO or something, which does suck for KO, but okay. Actually, that's really bad. Never mind. Sleep. I forgot. I was thinking of the might token, not the, not the make everything a six power, hero ability. So I don't know. It's, you send like some dumb arrow that doesn't matter. Just sort of like, like a remorseless. Right, like remorseless. remorseless. They don't care. They're gonna take an extra three points of damage. They don't give a shit. <laughs> like, yeah. So, you send that, and like so their turns like unlocked, and then they hit you for like twenty one, and now you're in a hole. Right. So. That's you the hear issue. An ace in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> So, I don't know. I like the deck. It's, I haven't played in a while. It's kind of, it's kind of fine. <laughs> yeah, it's the Ranger Roomblade problem. Um, oh, where that's also true. Balance, yeah. balance of non-attacks and attacks need to be balanced in a way so that, but you can always, you're going to inevitably run to those hands with all attacks or all non-attacks. Um, I will say that in my first match on Sunday against uh, Carlos, he didn't, miss a single turn about ha <laughs> of, uh, having a ton of or like at least disruption two... red and the ledger and stuff all kinds of crazy well no, not even red of the ledger just two non-attacks and then a dominate arrow basically and i'm uh, like yeah, well, damn. yeah 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 they'll do that all right anyway, uh and then um, going on to kano jerkai of ether he's got eight wins uh, he's yeah. kind of right in the middle it's kind of fine mm -hmm. i feel like i feel like what's holding kano back from getting a lot of wins uh, is just the skill of the player playing Kano. Player experience, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the deck sometimes just does not work with you. It just doesn't do the thing like at the yeah. right time. So uh, he could have more wins because people's decks could have been running better for good players, or he could be winning more than expected because um, some other decks just aren't prepared to play against Kano because they just don't think they'll hit the Kano that comes to their uh, local event. So it's... Uh, if anything, I think this is the more um, uh, 
like a the bigger argument for whether or not heroes should get LS or living legend points from a store level is something like Kano. I feel like he needs them. Get him out of here. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying I'm saying like him getting living legends points at a store level can be so not an actual like like representation of like him representation doing anything of like it, exactly it it that could honestly just come down to lo the local player experience or one player versus the uh, meta of decks that decide to side for everything else but kano maybe um he, he's the most polarizing of the heroes in terms of like how he can get his like wins truly in, it feels truly. like um then we move on to uh dash, dash inventor extraordinaire and the interesting thing about this uh, is that this week moves Dash into number one on the Living Legend board at like 797 yep. or 798, something like that. And so she's basically a pro tour win away from blinking out of existence, as DM Armada call it. So, yeah, it's interesting. So she'll probably be gone this year at some point, if I had to guess, which is fine. I mean, is she our first? We already have it. Rising? We already have it. Flash we already war. have another dash, so I know. You know. Well, and she's she our first WAC, as they call it, hero that's gonna be living legend. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. WAC being Weapon Wraith, Arcane Rising, and Crucible War for those mm -hmm. listening. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you don't count the Blitz heroes, of course, but yeah, what she uh, for the <laughs> for the adult hero? Yeah, she would be the uh, first. And like I said, we already have a new dash, so you're not even losing access to your cards. You just have to play a different version. It's crazy uh, how good she was for so long in those early metas that she was like the deck to beat for so long. She was back in the Crucible meta it was her and Dory that were like the two decks to really beat. And uh, if you weren't playing one of them, you were having a bad time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, unless Ninja kind of. Unless you're a competent, unless you're a competent Kano player, maybe. I was gonna say Katsu kind of uh, could put the dash in some bad spots too, as long as sure. they were hitting hitting pretty fast. Uh, uh, that's, the, that's the difference, though, is the uh, consistency. And Dash and Dory were the consistent decks. Yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, I miss those days sometimes. But uh, moving on, uh, Prism Awakener of Souls, the next one. So uh, can I actually add one more thing to the dash thing? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so this is kind of the example, like I said, where uh, a hero can be doing well and snowballing some living legends points. And then like all of a sudden just stops like getting any for a while or <laughs> right, any significant Fi. amount Fi, for a while. Literally, yeah, Fi has, did Fi's right underneath and he's like he did that just that. He won all those like there was a world where Fi was like the most broken degenerate like everyone Deck. hates Fi, it's too fast, it's too consistent, it's too strong. And then they banned Belittle and Stubby Hammers, and suddenly Fi wasn't a problem anymore. <laughs> so. Yep. And Ice Lightner was a thing for a long time in Fi's lifespan. So they needed to do both though, because the Belittle was getting them blue free blues in hand. Yeah. So it was like, woo, no Ice Lightner <laughs> problems. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Prism Awakener Soul, uh, we've seen the interesting thing about this one is that Prism uh, is actually down eight wins, eight or so wins. I think she had 15 last week, uh, maybe 13, somewhere in there. She's down a, a good chunk of wins that she had from week two. And I think this is because I think Prism in a vacuum is the strongest, best math deck in the format with a crazy combo turn, but she is the easiest deck, even more than Kano in my opinion, that when she's good, it is the easiest deck to tech against. It doesn't even take a lot. If you're worried about auras, you put in your stupid lead the charges or time snap potions. If you're worried about poppers, every deck can play command and conquer, good seven attacks you can play. Fiendel's Fighting Spirit, things like that, that do really well into her. And mm -hmm. you just do fine. <laughs> I don't know. Like, there are times where, like, you'd be surprised. Like, if you can just, even if they're not on the ALS loop plan, and you just clear two auras in a turn with, like, a time snap potion or a uh, time lead skippers. the charge or time skippers, <laughs> like, the game plan just, like, falls apart. She's so far behind at that point. So... Yeah, I think that's like a lot of what we're seeing. You have to be also kind of the Kano thing as well, is that like she's not an easy deck to play at all. You can't just pick her up and like 
figure the deck out. It takes a lot of practice. She, and... She's another polarizing deck, kind of like Kano, yeah, where it's yeah. like a local meta is not a good representation of her performance overall. Uh, Prism, Prism is definitely, yeah, like you said, not a deck you could just pick up and start playing. Um, you need to be pretty... Uh, pretty familiar with like the fundamentals of the game and the fundamentals of other decks in the meta that you're playing against to know where your value comes in. Yep. And I'm just going to run down the rest of the list. Everything under the, this yeah. point is going to be six wins or less. So we have Bolton at six, Katsu at five, Leviah at five, Azuri at four, Viserai at four, and then other heroes at 13 total. They don't tell us how many wins because I guess it's sub four. So we have Reinar, Teklavosin, Riptide, Bravo, Dashio, Phi, Max, the hype Nitro, and Vincent all getting wins. So yeah. pretty diverse meta. I mean, the only real issue, if I was going to have an issue, is KO's 24 wins. Uh, but that's not even like, if I look at this pie chart and I compare it to pie charts of games we've played in the past, of like top eights and oh, stuff. Oh like, my God. This is like beautiful, even at this, this rate. This is. So, uh, Bro, no, so play the deck you like, compare. honestly. Other games can't compare to having this diverse a set of wins when it comes to um, uh, semi-professional events. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, absolutely. like even even uh, uh, what's it called? Max getting a getting a win somewhere and Vincent getting a win somewhere. Just like, yeah, let's let's see these other heroes uh, up on the charts, baby. Right. Just play the deck you like. Be really good at it. Practice in your pride. A good thing to do, I think, would be take the top five or six heroes of this if you're even if you're one of them playing one of them and just practice into those decks as much as possible get a good idea of what you want to do in each matchup you'll probably even like understand what you want to do in most of the other matchups just because they're like similar decks and yeah. you'll, you'll probably do you'll pretty well yeah you'll get a healthy understanding of where you need to stand in the game uh, maybe you get some uh, extra practice rounds against some of the more obscure but still popular heroes but like prism maybe like see if you have a local prism player who knows what they're doing but <laughs> so not me i don't know what i'm doing <laughs> i swear to god um but uh yeah i mean like uh, i played max on sunday i went one and four but it's not because my deck was bad or even because i played bad necessarily i just wasn't as ready for the matchups that i went up against that i could have been so, uh, that's totally understandable so and that's the, that's the yeah. practice i didn't get but the practice that could have made all the difference in my deck list and that's uh that's the meta for the week mm -hmm. and we got one more week of pro quest uh so good luck to everyone who's going to be out at your local stores grinding for that pro quest win that gets you a gold foil and the invite to amsterdam uh, yeah you're going uh you're going to play the saturday instead of judge the saturday I am. Which, oh, yeah, uh, let's talk about playing? that a little bit so i did judge uh this past pro quest at the collective a uh, great mm -hmm. store down here in central florida um i love it actually uh Great, beautiful store, beautiful tables to play at, lots of space, excellent staff. Um, just can't say enough about Collective. Large That's, community, too. Large, large community of local players who want to play the game. It's so. OG community, too. We started that community in, like, November of 2019. Mm -hmm. It's like when we first started, then COVID happened, and then we started, came back once we got through COVID. And we didn't even yeah. really get through COVID. We were in Florida. We were closed for like a week. But. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think we started like during Crucible of War. That's yeah, when yeah, we uh, really brought them into it. So. Yep. So um, that said, judging was a pretty fun experience. I'll say I try to keep it going as best as possible. Make sure the rounds are firing, you know, snap, snap, snap. Let's go. Make sure it was, a, it was a smooth event. Yeah. yeah. For you being like the only judge there. So. No, was, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and yeah, we had some interesting questions. I don't know if you know this one. Uh, you might because I think I talked to you about it. But uh, if you banish, and <laughs> if you play already dead, and you banish a Teclavosin piece, do you get a silver for the base equipment? I didn't know, so I had to look it up uh, because it's been a while, and that's not a ruling that comes up very often. So when a top card is banished, and there's cards underneath it, the cards underneath it. Um, they're not the cards being affected by the card. So the top card gets banished and then the cards underneath it don't follow it. They go to the grave. They get cleared. So they go to the graveyard. Yeah. So no, you do not get a silver for banishing those because they don't even get banished. So I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I had to look it up. <laughs> Shout out to the yeah. judge discord for that, having that ready to go. <laughs> that is 
a good uh, good ruling to get, get on board, or just to understand for that one, basically one scenario where that matters. That was very, I was like, oh, that's a good question. In my head, uh-huh. I thought you could solve it. I was like, why not? You're contracted to banish non-action cards, and that's clearly a non-action card, and I assume... Yeah, but they're, they're like, not considered part of the actual equipment or item itself. They're considered, like, the soul of the equipment, where it's <laughs> like material. It. Yeah, material, yeah. Um, but how no, was playing? I mean, I, I mean, I had fun at the end of the day. Some of the matches were frustrating. Like I said, I was playing Max the Hype Nitro, um, mostly on a purely Construct-related deck. Um, and I'm realizing, based off of uh, watching some other videos and kind of looking into how the matchups go, um, maybe that's some, the part I need to change, which I'm going to work on for this weekend. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, I had fun. Um, it, some of the frustrating matches, like I said, included going up against Carlos's uh, Azalea because he just didn't have a single miss, <laughs> like a dominate plus two buff turn. And you got to get some warmongers I, diplomacy in that deck, my guy. Apparently. Um, <laughs> and honestly, that might not be a bad side, a sideboard item for matchups like that, but uh, I just need a more either that or defense reactions so I could just block from Arsenal at the very least. Like, good God, it was constant. And it didn't help that first turn he got a dominated sleep dart off before I even had a turn, so I didn't even get to set up first turn. Great. <laughs> and yes, uh, going into next week, uh, this is at the Haven also a good Central Florida store that we've been playing at for quite a while. Um, I will be playing Prism. I have made the decision. I'm locked. I'm locked. I'm going to play Prism. It's between Prism and Kasai. Those are the two decks I've been playing, and we're going to lock in Prism. And I'll let you I'm know how it goes. In. Yeah, I'm going to lock in Max again. I made some significant changes to the deck that I will uh, share with you guys after I see how well it does, <laughs> and maybe not if it doesn't do well. <laughs> but... Um, I'm, I'm yeah. confident with my play style on Max. I get how the deck goes. I'm, I I can keep track of my cards better in that deck than I can in other decks for some reason. Like, just knowing, like, my chances of banishing a card I need to keep off the top or something. Um, and it's like, I feel like it's just making sure I have the right cards for different matchups or maybe a different plan for different matchups that I need to work on with him. And he's fun and fantastic as a max so i'm down to make him a uh, a real star this weekend absolutely all right and with that i mean we have a lot coming up we're going to be able to talk about they released the spoiler schedule uh so we're gonna be seeing some spoilers coming out soon i'm ready for part of the miss veil there's a calling when's the, coming when's up the first real quick when is the first spoiler so uh, i said the start? schedule but it's not really a schedule. They didn't give any days. <laughs> Just like the list, I guess, of spoilers of people oh, who are spoiling. Give days? I didn't oh, see it. No, yeah, so, but we're getting a couple more uh, at Calling Warsaw, which is this weekend coming up, I think. You know what my guess is? Here's my guess. So in all of these recent like events where they just spoil a few cards, they've been doing the um, expansion slot. Expansion slot. And what expansion slot uh classes have we not seen we've seen ranger the shadows um we haven't seen light uh yet for example so we, we haven't need seen more light cards i don't know we apparently needed more shadow cards and those both are insane my dude <laughs> well i think vincent needed it i will say that i think vincent needed it uh the Lavaya. the Lavaya one is <laughs> more than she could ask for she are like i said when you take into account that the blood debt is a necessary or i think i decent balancing mechanic for how overpowered her cards are to an extent like that card alone is oh my god insane lss saw um, everyone making fun of it that prism was gonna have two living legend heroes before leviah had one even though they came yeah. out at the same time and they took that personally they said okay <laughs> like, we'll see yeah um uh, we also haven't seen any mech um Ooh, yeah i think max needs a card or two specifically yeah i think dash io and i even think tecla Vosin are actually in a good spot if tecla doesn't see an arcane based well, hero so dash already had a full set where she got specializations that she can still use on the new version that still revolves around items which her new hero even plays off of still yeah so she's she's fine um now we need you could to... say that they make a generic mech card that boosted mechs could use but 
for Tekla Voss, and it's going to have to specifically revolve around Evo stuff if it's going to be anything for him. They can give him an Evo that has Arcane Barrier. That'd be neat. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> that yeah. would be pretty nice. Um, so, because, like, in the last set, we only just got Evo Magneto as a <laughs> um, mech uh I like I kind of like card. I kind of like the head cannon though that like I don't know that like the technologically advanced people are bad against magic because in every trope ever that's like always the thing yeah it's always the thing like oh we have like these super advanced like oh we're going to cast spells at you and you die anyway or <laughs> whatever <laughs> that is funny that is funny um so maybe not arcane barrier but something and it, yeah max especially like the only specialization he's got was banksy which feels a little too balanced for like draft purposes um i want banksy purposes. to be good don't give me a new car just make banksy playable somehow i don't know how you do well, it so that's but. what i'm that's what i'm saying maybe a specialization of some sort um or or in moonshot moonshot was essentially a max specialization that for some reason didn't have max on it uh or max specialization on it even though it had him in the picture um and he's the only one who can make hyper drivers fast enough for that card to be relevant at all uh but some, something something else that makes his game plan or whatever game plan they intended for him a little more consistent or a little cooler, maybe just something. Yeah. Maybe an item that lets you take a hyperdriver from your banish and put it on top of your deck so you can do something with it. I don't know. I, I get what you're saying. I totally get it. I get it. I get it. I'd be looking. I would love something like that. So let's see what Person. we get. We'll be able to talk about it. You know, this time next week, you guys will be seeing it and we'll be talking about it. Whatever gets call, uh, spoiled at this calling and at all these events, we'll definitely bring it to you. And it'll be right here at Adventure Co. Gaming. And we're going to have some other stuff, you know, staying coming down the come down the pike. So make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Make sure you don't miss a single episode of any of the Battle Warm podcasts or any of the stuff we have coming up. So I think with all that, I think it's time to get out of here, Ryan. And hope you guys are going to do well at your ProQuest season or ProQuest week four, season five. So good luck. And anything, any last words, Ryan, before we get out of here? No, I think uh, I'm excited for this weekend. I'm excited to give it another shot at the uh, ProQuest and uh, fingers crossed. Do we do well or at least get some sort of max specialization reveal as a consolation? All right. <laughs> and we will see you on the next adventure. Peace out. We're out of here. Later.